So um, I'm going to talk to you about CMake today. So CMake is something that is kind of a passion to me because I like to have good tools when I work. And if I don't have good tools, it's kind of hard. The good thing about CMake that I like is that it's really flexible. And you can do a lot of things with it. And so in the past years, when I worked at Spotify, I rewrote all the CMake files that we had, and I added a lot of things that helped the developers' productivity. Some of them I'm going to show you today. But before we get to that, I will introduce you to CMake because I'm sure not everyone is familiar with it, so we should probably start with that. So CMake, what is it? So CMake, it's a build file uh, generator, meaning it generates files. It doesn't build, which is something that people don't necessarily grasp about it. Um, the build files are written in a compiler independent configuration language, platform independent. And it's using something uh, that is called the CMake language, which is not necessarily the nicest. Um, I think most people who use CMake will agree on that. But it is what it is. It is quite flexible still. CMake allows you to do multiple things. First, it will allow you to build um, your software by generating other files. Uh, it will allow you to test your software. And it will allow you also packaging your software. So CMake itself is a cross-platform software. So it will run on Windows, it will run on Mac, it will run on Linux, it will run on AIX, it will run on a lot of different platforms. It's very, very flexible software. It's open source. You can always contribute. You can always build it from source yourself if you want, uh, if you want to use it on some exotic platform. CMake put a lot of emphasis on backwards compatibility. So if you have some old scripts, they will still work today, probably, minus bugs. But they should work. And that makes um, things really easy to, to upgrade to newer versions of CMake and to reuse old code. CMake, I told you, is a build file generator. And it will build files for lots of different IDs and build tool. So Visual Studio, Xcode, it will build uh, make files, it will build uh, ninja files, and many other things. You can have, I'm not going to talk to you about all the different exhaustive po possibilities. You can find that in the documentation. But I'm just going to put like some emphasis on the major ones that you can use. And CMake now is becoming quite popular. So now it has integration in some major IDs. The latest Visual Studio 2017 supports CMake. CMake is bundled with it. And you can just open a CMake project, build it directly, debug, do everything as normal. Qt Creator also works. CLion works as well with it. Android Studio and Gradle work with it if you want to work on Android. There's no Xcode integration, but since you have uh, Xcode files that are generated, it kind of works. It's, kind of tra it's transparent for users. And since it works on all those platforms, of course, CMake uh, targets uh, lots of different platforms like Windows, Mac, iOS. It will target Linux, Android, and many others. But why CMake? Why this tool and not another one? And I show you here a graph of the Google Trends, searches on Google about various build tools. And you have CMake in blue, <coughs> which is the one going up. And all the others are other solutions for uh, writing cross-platform software. They're all losing popularity. CMake now is a tool that everyone supports. Well, almost everyone. And 
since everyone supports it, it's easy for library developers to write some Cynic files to allow um, users of a library to integrate their library in the project and write cross-platform software, which is now more important than ever with uh, the mobile first um, and the desktop renaissance that we have. So we, we have like a lot of different things um, in favor of CMake. And that's why I believe CMake is a valuable tool to learn and to use when you are writing a library. It's not perfect, but it makes things a lot easier for your users. And if you see this big notch here, well, I should probably point it here. I believe that um, probably really, no, or this one, probably the release of Visual Studio support for CMake. And this one was probably the release for integration of CMake in another big project. So, you know, usage is going higher and higher. And there's a lot of companies who committed to CMake. So it's only going to get better. So CMake, is a software that is pretty easy to install. If you go on the cmake.org uh, page, you can find uh, pre-built packages. So static builds for uh, Linux that runs on really old versions of Linux, so you, you should not have any problem with that. Uh, you have pre-built versions for Windows, pre-built versions for Mac. If you're on Mac, you can also find it in Homebrew. If you don't use it, I would highly recommend it because it makes things really easy to manage. And for Linux users, I just want to remind you, you're not stuck to your package manager. You can also use static builds and add them to the path. It's just an extra tool. It's not necessarily going to replace the system one. It's not going to necessarily create any conflicts. If you want to use newer features of CMake, because it's updated regularly with new features that are all interesting, please try them, because it helps a lot not to be on an ancient version. And as I said, it's also bundled with uh, Visual Studio, Android Studio, um, well, and the Android NDK. So here's your first CMake program, if you haven't used CMake before, on the left. So it's just three commands. CMake minimum required with some version, which says you need this minimum version of CMake, 3.1, to use it. Project, this is a project called Hello World. So far, this is boilerplate. And then you have something simple. You say, I have an executable, a binary that I'm, I want to build called Hello World, that is composed of a file called hello.cpp. And that's it. That's all your CMake file. Two lines of boilerplate and one line that I split in free for readability of actual code. And when you do that, you get CMake that is doing all the things that is, it knows how to do. Detection of the compiler, setting up all the build flags, setting up all the different configurations, all the different things that I'm going to talk to you about later. And it will allow you to build. So on the command line, if you use the command line, there's also a GUI client, but command line makes it easier because it works on all platforms the same. You can just create a folder out. You go in there. You tell CMake find the file in the parent folder and build the files that are in the current folder. And this will build, call the actual uh, build tool to actually build it. So in this case, by default, it's make. It's going to call make, make outputs is here. And it says, yeah, I built uh, target hello world. You can run it, hello world. So that, that's the basics of CMake. CMake also has an interpreter mode. Uh, the language is quite flexible. You can do a lot of things with it. And you can also invoke scripts directly with it as if it was bash. But uh, if you work in Windows, you don't necessarily have bash. So you don't want to write uh, shells, um, um, CMD scripts or PowerShell either on Mac or Linux. So you can use CMake also always. Um, it's always a, a good fallback. Well, a fallback. Uh, good is up to you. Um, so that's the basics. The CMake language um, is a language that is 
common based. There's one command per line. So it will look like set uh, foo bar add executable. Add executable is a comment. If is a comment. All of those are comments and they have arguments. All this sorry, I shouldn't click. So all those comments are just comments. They are procedure. They don't return value. They're not functions. So you cannot nest them. You cannot do like an if so variable assignment and test it at the same time. One comment per line, simple. Maybe too simple for some people, but at least it's easy to parse. Comments can have uh, many arguments and sometimes uh, overloads. Um, so for example, there's a comment called file, which has multiple profiles. One allows to write some data to a file. Another one with read will read from some file. So if you go to the documentation of TMake and you look at the description of a comment, it will list all the different variants, sometimes show you examples, uh, describe all the different parameters that you can pass, uh, which is a really good way. The comments usually have names that are kind of intuitive, so just have a look uh, in the documentation. Uh, we're going to have a look at it uh, in a little bit. The language has variables. Well, it's a programming language. Those are set with set. So uh, you have an example on the left, set foo bar. It sets a variable called foo with value bar. It's a string here. And the thing with the language is that all the variables are string. So if I do set foo bar, this sets a string as well, just like here. If I said set foo 42, a random number, you will get a string as well with 42 inside. It's up to the comments to interpret um, all the values in the way they want. So sometimes if they do want to do uh, math operations, they will convert them to a number. But most of the time, it's going to be strings. And even lists are strings. So you have here an example of a list. Um, it's one semicol uh, semicolon, two semicolon, three, which is a list with three elements. So the example with a, with a quote, are they both included in the string for the first example? Is it no. Characters or is it three? No, so the quotes are not included in the string, but if you wanted to have uh, spaces, you would need to quote them. So uh, because if you don't quote them, here, when you do set one to three separated, it's the same thing as doing the line before, which is declaring a um, list uh, with values one to three, and lists are semicolon separated. So that's a list, it's a string, depends how you use it. Um, so most, most of the time, it's just a string. And also uh, to read, to access a, va a value for a variable, it's with dollar uh, curly uh, parentheses. Uh, you do that all the time. There's no, if it's a single character, you don't need them. You put them all the time, and that's easier. So the CMAC language also has some control flow in instructions. So you will have if, else if, else, and if. You will have. Um, so that's an if, and then an else if, and else. It's kind of self-explanatory, right? Um, most of the, all the control flow instructions end with and, name of the first instruction. So, and if. For the for each, it will end with and for each. And while. You also have um, break, continue, and return, which will work the same way as it would do in C++ in a loop. So interrupt a loop or go to the next element in the loop, or return if you are in a function. Comments start with a pound, hashtag, depends on, or sharp, uh, if you're a musician. So I am a comment. This is a comment. You have uh, some other things that are kind of important. You have include, which is very similar to the C++ well, the C, C++ preprocessor include, which uh, just copies the content of a file into the current one. Um, 
same context. Add subdirectory is another way to say, I want to go into this folder and restart the, uh, in a new context, and it will read that file, and it will search for another file called cmakelist. It creates a new context, something that I'm going to talk a little bit later about. And there you have also your message function. If you want to print some strings for debugging, for information, whatever you need. Then you have uh, the variable scope, something that is quite of important to learn, I believe. So all the variables that you have are scoped. So each scope that you have has a local copy of all the variables. When you leave the scope, that copy is destroyed. The scopes are created um, by calling add subdirectory, which is a good way to um, recurse into different uh, CMake projects or modules. Or if you have a function call, um, you have different. You can create custom functions, and that will create um, a separate uh, context. You have a top-level scope, which is called the cache, which is global. And you can set values in the cache from the beginning uh, when invoking CMake. So, uh, for example, you have set foo bar, set the variable foo in the current scope with value bar. Set foo bar parent scope. This is a special value that says set it not in this scope, in the previous one. If you wanted to have available in the current one, you need to do both. You can also set, oh, I want to set a global uh, a G foo that is going to be global. I say that it's in a cache, and you have some arguments that you have to pass, which is a type, string all the time, it's fine, and some documentation about it, because the cache is also a way to configure different configuration nodes for your scripts. If you want to overwrite a variable in the cache that already exists, you pass an extra value force, and you can set values uh, from the command line dash D, just like a define in the prop processor. So I'm going to show you now some program uh, with CMake, a FizzBuzz. So if you're not familiar with it, uh, it counts from 1 to N. If the number is divisible by 3, it prints Fizz. If it's divisible by 5, it prints Buzz. If it's divisible by both, it prints FizzBuzz. Otherwise, it, it will print the number just a number. So here I define a function called fizzbuzz, which has an argument n. And I tell it, like, I want to go for each value sets uh, a variable i that goes from a range that is from 1 to value n. And then, so I have my loop here. I set a result to empty string. I do some mathematic operations, some module operation to check if something is divisible by three, even by five, and I check is it equals to zero if not fizz, which is a way to test if something is um, equals to zero, empty string, or false, or uh, a few other things that you have noted in the documentation. If it equals to zero in this case, because this is going to output a number, then I add the result, I add to the string result fizz. Same thing for buzz. If it's buzz equals zero, modulo uh, five equals zero, then it's divisible by five. I do buzz. If I don't have anything in result, meaning it wasn't changed, so it's not divisible by either, I set the result to the number and then I print it. Does anyone understand the fizz buzz so far in the CMake language? It's not the prettiest language, but it does a job. It's quite easy to understand. You know, the syntax is a little bit odd, but it's kind of easy, I believe. Well, I worked with it for so long, I shouldn't say that. So then you just run it. Uh, cmake dash p fizzbuzz cmake. I want to run the script. This is just a script, and it prints all the different values. 1, 2, fizz, 4, buzz, fizz, 7, 8, etc. Fizz buzz. So that. 
uh, it's included in the message. Uh, it does an implicit end line. That's all about it. If you want to do multiple line output, you need to concatenate in, your str uh, in a variable before and then do one message if you want to do it all at once. But you can just do it like sequentially. It's going to work as well. So now let's have a look at how to create a CMake project. So as I told you, there's some bullet plates at the beginning of a project. So uh, the bullet plate I showed you before, CMake minimum required and project. That's in the file called CMake lists uh, with that capitalization, C majuscule, uh, uppercase C, uppercase M, uppercase L, dot txt, and don't forget the S. It's a fixed name. Um, that's how it is. Um, makes it easy to find. Um, so in that file, you will put all the different boilerplates. For example, I want to say uh, minimum version required, I require version x dot y. For in the previous example, I said 3.1. Now the current version is 3.11. You probably want to target something that is version 3.11. Four, five, six. This is usually what you will find in most um, Linux distributions. If you are on, if you have control, easy control about the CMake version, please use the latest one or something quite recent. Um, project, you put a project name that's going to be the name of your Visual Studio solution or Xcode project workspace. Uh, you can set different. Um, options that are knobs you can use that set some variables. For example, here, if I want to enable secret feature, I use a common option, secret feature. I can put some documentation string, and by default, it's off. And I can just say also, I want to recurse in different, in different folders where there will be the definition for my library and my executable, which are uh, to name the solution, the solution. So if I say project name foo, it will create a foo.sln for Visual Studio, or a foo. Dot, um, project, I think, on Xcode. So it wouldn't be necessary if you only use. No, basic. it's not necessary. So it's just to have a, a name for a project. It can be useful in some advanced contexts, like uh, you can access some variables that are specific to some projects and things like that. But most of the time, 99% of the time, you don't really care too much about it. Um, if you have a big repository for your uh, company that is all built on CMake, you can name it with your company name. For all it matters, it doesn't really matter. So this uh, is like, I would say, a basic file. The project called here is the one that is doing most of the job because this is where CMake is going to run all the detection of your environment. It will detect which platform it's running on. It will detect the compiler. It will detect what um, targets the compiler is targeting by default or what options you pass to the compiler to target cross-compile or something like that. Uh, it will detect all the feature, what version of C++ it supports, 11, 14, 17, a lot of different things. It will try the compiler. It will see if it works or not. Um, so most of the time at the beginning is spent here, and then it goes into your different targets to actually see their definitions. So that's the basic boilerplate you can have the beginning. You can have a lot more things, but I would recommend to, tr to try to keep it as simple as possible. So then you will want to create targets. So uh, as I said before, I want to go into the subdirectory mylib and define a uh, mylib target. So for that, I will use add library, which is a command that defines a library. So we will say add library mylib and you can pass different options and different source files. For the executable, you would do add executable, my exe. You can tell it to make a Win32 binary. You can tell it to make a Mac OS bundle. Uh, you can give it source files. So those are the main 
uh, commands that you will use to define your targets, things that you will build. There are also other things that you can have, which are custom targets um, that you can name, where you actually specify uh, command lines that you will want to run. So for example, I want to have a special target that is deploying my application. So it will run a script that is building your application and then deploying it to your backend servers. If you want to do your deployment that way, you can create a deploy target there. Um, for all those options, I don't list all the different parameters. You can go to the documentation and check all of them. Uh, just put the most important things that you will use today at least. So rules define targets. Uh, targets, uh, as I said, uh, for libraries can be static, shared, or interface. <coughs> what does it mean? So a library that is shared means it's going to be shared library, dynamic library, so a DLL, a uh, SO file, a dilib on Mac. Static library is a .lib or .a, something that is going to link to your executable that you don't need to ship with it. It's, it's linked with. An interface, it's uh, an interface library is a virtual target. It doesn't have any concrete instance in your project or in your command line. If you say, make my, my interface library, it's not going to work because it doesn't really exist, but it's a way to pass requirements to other targets. So for example, if you have a header-only library, so it's something that you can use and say, I have a header-only library that needs this include directory to work, and when you use it, in your project, it will pass uh, that includes directories to all the users and uh, it will work. S but the problem with that is that interface libraries, since they don't show up in your IDs, they have issues. They're not really good for developers. So if you're writing a header-only library, I wouldn't recommend to make it an interface library. I would recommend it to make it static so you get to see all the files when working in your IDE. Otherwise, they will not show up, and it's going to be a little bit awkward to work with. Make it static library with um, random CPP file, demi CPP file with a simple symbol. It's not going to impact your um, build uh, time, and it should work the same way. So, for your targets, uh, you need to define, as I said, include directories. Uh, to say where are the headers. You need to define uh, compile definitions, preprocessor definitions, so what you would pass as dash D on the command line. Uh, compile options, if you want to say, uh, for example, I want to have uh, all the warnings. So all of those have public interface and private uh, arguments, which I would recommend to use. They are optional, but please use them. Um, and the way you can use them is like this. For example, include directories. I say for mylib, I have a public um, include directory called inc include. Sorry. And I have a private include directory called source. And you will put your API in the, in the public one and your private files in the private one. So. So you just pass names of folders and it will work. Uh, for compile definitions, you can pass directly a value equals something, uh, name equals value, or just a name if you just want it to be defined without a value, and uh, compile options. So as I said, it was public, private, and interface. Uh, those are how things are propagated. So things are propagated um, by using something called the command target link libraries. That one is how you connect to targets. So I say, for example, my executable uh, links with my lib. And then when you build the executable, when you link it, it's going to have the static or dynamic library that you built for my lib to be on the command line for your executable. And th the same way, it can be public, private, or interface. What does it mean? So private is something that is just 
local to the target. It means if you have a user, if you have multiple library, def multi define multiple libraries, then things are not going to propagate uh, when they are private, and they are just going to be kept for the current target. So if you have uh, any options, any, any include directory on the library that you depend on, you will see them in your target, but your users of your library won't see them. So you can keep it as implementation detail. Um, those are all usage requirements that are not propagated. With public, they will be propagated. So if my library, for example, its API is using Boost uh, in all the public headers, I want any user on my library to find the Boost headers as well. So I will uh, set it to public so that users will also see Boost directly in the project at the same time. Otherwise, it will be hidden until the final link stage, not during the compilation stage. An interface is a way to have options to be propagated as a user of the library, but you, they are not used when building the library. For example, I want to say um, to users of my library that yes, they, have, they are linking with this library. So for example, something that is, I've seen commonly used like use OpenSSL to say that my library should use OpenSSL. So if you link against OpenSSL, your OpenSSL target can define this in the interface, and then all the users of uh, OpenSSL will have a define called use OpenSSL when they build, and so they can detect if they are leaking against the target directly in the code. So an example of that, for example, is uh, defining a library called mylib, which is static, which has some files. So an include file, called mylib.h in the folder include mylib, which has some implementation uh, in the source folder with a header and the source file. That library needs to find all the headers that it's going to include. So um, it says, well, when you're linking against my library, you're going to have headers in the include folder. When you are uh, search building the library itself, you're going to search also in the source folder. And when you are linking against the library, you're also going to use boost here. And by doing that, it will also it will not on only link with boost, but it will also add all the usage requirements for boost. So all the include paths, all the defines that are required to be uh, using boost. And so on the file system, it will look like this. You have mylib folder with a file called semiclist, include mylib with mylib, um, the implementation <coughs> file. Just one question. Sure. Does this make the symbol private and the final executable? No. no. It just makes uh, the um, header files or the defines and includes uh, not propagated to all the user. Uh, if you have multiple libraries that depend on each other, uh, all the requirements are going to stop uh, propagating when it becomes private. So if my library is using Boost in the source files and not in the API, I don't want people to have Boost in their uh, search path. So I'm going to put it private, and users are going to be totally um, blissfully ignorant that Boost is used when they build a library. So we don't get by surprise any conflicting headers, for example. So it just makes requirements to be uh, not propagated. If you make it public, then if I depend publicly on Boost, then you're going to have Boost available in your include path. Or any option. Yes? No, it, it's just uh, looking in the top level folder. So it's adding dash i folder name on the command line. Right, so then you would need to include, do on the uh, your source file, uh, dash include mylib slash mylib.h. Because if you just have like a mylib.h, it might conflict with other things, so it's usually best to put it in the folder 
to prefix it with a folder name, usually with named after your library. Just like you have all the boost headers that are in a folder called boost, so you do include boost slash, um, I don't know, algorithms, uh, boost slash. So mylib.h is not public? Uh, mylib.h is um, public, yes. It, it's a world folder that is exposed on the command line. Yes. Oh, target include uh, directories. Yes, not include libraries. Sorry. Yes, I should fix it. Uh, it's target include directories. Sorry. Um, yeah, so sorry. Should fix it here. Include. Well, of course, when I try to type, it's never working as I want. Directories, all right. And then yeah, no, that, that is correct, because you just want to have your include to be include mylib slash mylib.h in your source file. So it's correct to actually say, start exposing all uh, your include files from this folder. Yes? Uh, I know this is a example, but how does it find it? It's something that is somewhere else. Um, uh, just for the sake of an example, um, you will we'll get to that later. Um, yes? What about the That's the name of the target. Yeah, but what's, it, what's the scope in, in uh, It's just a string. Everything is a string. Uh, yes, so uh, usually when you have external libraries, they are uh, prefixed by the name of the package, colon, colon, and then the name of the internal library. So you would have this one is for the header of boost. You will have boost, colon, colon, thread for the thread library, boost, colon, colon, system. You will have a lot of different things like that. Um, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later for boost, um, but thanks for mentioning it. So to define your libraries, you also have a lot of legacy CMake comments that you might see in old CMake files. Those are like include directories, add definitions, add dependency, add compile option. Please do not use them to actually configure your targets because those have a global effect on, not global effect, but an effect on everything that is in the current folder where it's used and all the subfolders. If you use that at the root of your project, for example, include directories, uh, some library, every target will find it. But it's not going to be added to the usage requirements of these libraries. So if it's not added to the usage requirements of the libraries, all the users of those libraries, external users that are outside of the folder where you actually used include directories, are not going to be aware that this library is using some other includes. And so it's not going to work for them. Compatibility of CMIC projects is something that is important. You should be able to take a project from somewhere, put it in your source tree, and just do add subdirectory, and it should work. And you have, uh, for example, a new library. You have libpng, you have zlib, you have um, boost, you have different things, and you should be able to compose them, put them, for example, in the vendor folder or uh, in some other with some other mechanism. And if you don't have targets that are properly defined and self-contained, it's not going to work. So those are legacy CMake comments. If you're using some uh, scripts that are made for CMake 2, you will find a lot of those. And I would encourage you to update to use all the variants that I presented, targets include target, compile, uh, definitions, options, etc. Uh, so, that's so that's a different thing. So, it's not. Uh, so I would say. 
don't use it to actually um, define your libraries. You can use them for global options um, like um, wall or WERROR. I it's okay if you know what you're doing. But uh, be aware that if you pass anything that is really important in there, it's not necessarily going to be propagated to the users. So if it's something um, important like um, your uh, C++ version that is required, it's not necessarily going to be propagated. If you're using C++17 in your project and you say add compile options uh, stud equals C++17, your targets are going to build with C++17, but your headers that are using all the advanced features are not going to be used as C++17 and your target is not going to work when it's used. So you need to be aware of that. If you're at the top level of a project, sure, you can do that. If it's like an enterprise project, you know it's not going to be used by any other people, go for it. But just be aware that it might break some things depending on how you use it. So that's why I would recommend to actually use um, the other variants whenever possible. Because sometimes also you have some targets that are not building with uh, all errors enabled and you need to, defer to sign on some errors in some cases and not in all cases. So it's always a tricky thing when you have a large project, especially with warnings. Uh, <coughs> perhaps this is going down a rabbit hole, but let's say I have a library that I need to build a set of C++ 17 in. Uh, and in order to be uh, Linux compatible, I need all my dependencies to also build C++ 17. Yes. And my user to build and a client to engineer to a C++17, how would I do that? Because it sounds like I should build one of each. So uh, I would say um, in your um, source files, I would say check for the C++ version, error on that, if you don't build with the right version to make sure that it cannot build. So there are some defines that you can check. No, but then it's easy. Until very recently. Until very recently, yes. Uh, well, you can still check the compiler version to know if you're still compatible. But, um, but then, if you really want to everything to be built with the right version globally, I would say use a toolchain file, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, which is a way to say all your files are going to build with this compiler and with options uh, at the global level. Um, so there are also some features uh, in CMake where you can use, say, I want this target to build with C++17, with 14, 11, but it's a little bit tricky because if you mix and match libraries with different requirements, then you might get into some ABI conflicts with some libraries that depending on which version you build them with are have different implementations. So it's kind of a tricky thing to do, and I would not recommend using it. I would recommend like syncing it at the top level in your torsion file, which I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit later. So an example project is you have an executable that is depending on a library, that is depending on boost, that is external. You have an uh, executable that is also depending on mylib2, which depends on mylib3 and boost. And you just declare um, your direct dependencies. So all the arrows, you say, um, target link libraries, my executable, my lib, target link libraries, uh, well, my executable, my lib, and my lib2. And for my lib, you say I depend on boost, my lib2 on free, and this one on boost. And then CMake will propagate all the different things, all the different libraries, when actually linking your executable. So you just declare the immediate ones, and then everything is up to CMake to propagate. So you just work at on one library at a time. And that makes things easier to reason about. If you just like, configure one library, is this library correct, is the library well configured, then you can just make it work in isolation. And then when it works well, it's well configured, all the includes are there, all the dependencies are correctly declared, then you know any user of that library will be able to use it correctly. Um, and then it, it will propagate. So external libraries. So that's uh, what uh, some people were asking about earlier. So there are multiple ways to use third-party code with CMake. And you will find uh, proponents of 
every way that are very vocal and will hate on the other ones. There is no clear cut way. Uh, I will tell you my preference, but make your own opinion. I think it's nice to experiment with the tool and see what you like. So um, you can vendor library, copy the source code, put it in your repository, and say add subdirectory uh, zlib. And when you have a zlib folder with a semiac list file that builds a target called zlib, you can also do use uh, an external uh, semiac dependency manager. Uh, there are a few ones that, that exist. Some popular ones are Conan, Hunter, and VC package that are working uh, with CMake. So Conan is uh, backed by uh, Atlassian, I think. No. Um, JFrog, sorry. By JFrog, who's making Artifactory. Uh, you have Hunter, which is uh, a project of some person on the internet. It supports a lot of libraries. You have a uh, VC package which is backed by Microsoft, which uh, until last week was only working on Windows, and now it's supposed to work on Mac and Linux. I haven't tried it, but they just announced complete support. So uh, if you try it and it works, let me know uh, how you, what you find of it. For external libraries, you also have a command called find package. And you can say find package boost and it will try to find the boost library. And the way it does that is by trying, it will try to wait. One is finding a file called findboost.cmake that is in your CMake search path. Um, it will try to find the script that is searching on your file system for the library. So uh, in user include, user lib, in user local lib, in various folders in a folder that you specify to it manually uh, as well. It will try to find your library. It will try really hard. <coughs> and then it will tell you if it finds it or not. Yes? So where is the know what it finds? Yes. So usually, um, to know how it works, um, so there's, um, so as I said, there's uh, those scripts some of which are actually bundled with CMake. So then you can go in the CMake documentation, open the script, and usually there's documentation at the top that tells you which variables it's uh, creating and which um, targets it's creating. If it is creating any, it, it should create variables and targets, modern ones at least. Um, so then you can use that to check, for example, you have a variable that is usually called name of the library underscore found. You check if it's true, then it usually means it found the library. So usually find package supports a lot of different parameters like versions and uh, different components. Do I have a boost build with all the different libraries or do, did, did I get a distribution that just has a thread library when I also need the atomic library and other ones that are not necessarily available. So that's a really, that, that complex command, you go to the documentation, you will have plenty, uh, plenty <coughs> examples of it. Um, it can also find a file called name config. Usually this one will be provided by your uh, binary distribution of your library, and they will provide this file that you will, you will put in your path, uh, and then CMake will find it, and that file doesn't have any logic, it just has declaration, yeah, declare, a target called uh, boost and declare a target called this and that, set up all the include directories and all the defines, all the things that you need. You have another way, uh, which is called external project and fetch content, which I have in a slide a little bit later. This is a way to download code automatically from your CMake script and to actually build it either um, immediately or later um, when actually building the project. Um, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit advanced. I can show you an example if you want later. So so you can specify, uh, for example, if it's an archive, you can specify a hash of the archive. 
uh, you can, if it's a Git repository, you can specify a, a tag or you can specify a revision. So then it's up to you to make sure that the resource is always available. So if you're in an enterprise context, make a copy uh, in your network and use that copy. Don't rely on finding things all the time on GitHub. It might be down. The repository might be shut down or whatever. So make copies, use the hash to make sure that builds are repeatable. Um, so all those have different uh, pros and cons. One of the major um, difference, I think, is when targeting uh, multiple platforms or targeting different ABIs um, or different options, um, compilation options, some of them work better than others. So those ones are going to work with, well, uh, VC package mostly will work with pre-built binaries. And it can rebuild some things, but it might not always forward all the requirements. Uh, Conan will try really hard to forward the requirements, but I heard of people having issues with it. Or same with Hunter. So if you're building, for example, your software mainly on Linux, and you need to now release it on Mac, you don't have pre-built binaries. Those tools will try to rebuild them, but it might not be transparent, it might not work correctly, it's kind of sometimes difficult. So CMake dependency managers might work for you, but if you want full flexibility, I would recommend either to copy the, li the libraries in your source folder, vendor them, and use their CMake files, or write your own CMake files. Since you're go all going to be CMake expert at the end of the talk, you will be able to do that, uh, I hope. So uh, copies, <coughs> libraries, make your own CMake files. They can be really simple. They don't need to be exhaustive, support all the options, support what your projects need. Um, or you can use external project or fetch content, which is uh, only from CMake 3.11, which has been released last month, I, I believe. So might not be available to everyone quite yet, but it's a way to download those source files and make them available in a project. So if you have the source files, you're always going to rebuild everything. If you rebuild everything, you know that you don't have any old binaries that are not up to date, that are not rebuilt uh, with the current compilation options. One of the uh, compilation options that I really love is uh, Sanitize Address, which is a way to use Address Sanitizer. It's an instrumentation tool that comes with Clang and GCC that allows you to find at runtime by adding some extra uh, um, instructions in your code automatically uh, defects. So I, if you read outside the boundaries of an array, um, there are some options that check that all the memory has been initialized. There's a lot of different things like that. And for those to work properly, you need to rebuild most of the things with that compilation option. If you don't, then when you change your, from some code that is using it to some code that isn't using it, it's going to link, but at the boundary, it, it might not, the instrumentation might not propagate, and it will not mark the memory as initialized. And if it's not marked initialized, when you try to read from it, it will show a false positive. So rebuilding everything is good. Rebuilding everything because you're targeting different platforms, different ABI, different architectures, automatically is also a good thing. And it gives you control, direct control. <coughs> I have an also question. I think it's important to stress this ABI issue you're mentioning. That yes. Uh, in my experience, it's extremely easy to accidentally introduce ABIs uh, into libraries that are too far from your system just to yep. find them. So there are some libraries that will change their implementation depending on whether they are using C++ 11, 14, or 17 because they will um, use their own mutex. Uh, and then they're like, oh, now I can use, well, C++ 98 or C++ 11. You don't have, uh, in C++ 11, you have stud thread. In 98, you don't have it. So if you have a handle, an opaque handle to a thread, and if you compile it with 98, it might be some pthread wrapper or win32 wrapper. If you're now building with C++11, it's going to be stud thread. 
that one is going to be different from the other implementation. And so if you try to pass handles from one from cross uh, boundaries of like uh, libraries built with different ABIs, then they're not going to be compatible and you will run into weird crashes and you're like, not understand what's happening in the debugger. So it, it's really important to build everything with the same flags uh, to, that are changing ABI, like C++ standard or instrumentation flags, for example. So with CMake, you can do some testing as well, uh, run tests. So if I build an executable called my test, I can use a command called enable testing and then I can define some tests. So I will add a test called my test that is running the command my test with some options. And that is creating a test. Well, I can build the binaries first, make my test, it will build this. And by calling ctest, which is a software that comes with CMake, you will run the test. So if you define 10, 20, 30, 100 tests, when you run ctest, it will run all those tests sequentially and tell you which ones passed or not. You can also tell it to do some reporting to some dashboard. You can tell it to do uh, running all the tests in parallel and lots of different things. Have a look at the documentation of ctest. It's quite flexible. So then there's something that is quite important to know as well. CMake has different configurations. Maybe sometimes you want to build in debug mode. Sometimes you want to be in Redis mode. Sometimes you want to be, uh, and there's two other um, configuration modes. So debug will be a mode where you have no optimization and debug information that is built uh, with your uh, target. So dash G with GCC or Clang, uh, slash Z something with, uh, slash debug actually with uh, Visual Studio. Really is you will have optimizations, I believe level two or three, but no debug information. Well, with dev info that you should read, uh, read is with debug info is optimization and debug information, which is probably what you want to do if you're releasing a library to users, is you want to keep the debug information for later for analysis of crashes and things like that. So which, this is probably one of the, uh, a really important one to know. And mean size release is one that is optimizing the binary for size usually dash OS, and uh, no debug information, I believe. There are some, uh, usually when you uh, configure a project with CMake, you specify which um, configuration you want with dash D CMake build type equals configuration name, debug, release, whatever. And we'll just build with that. So that's true, for example, for when you're targeting Ninja, make, ma make files, um, it will only target one. But if you're generating something for Visual Studio or for Xcode, it will generate everything side by side. And then it's up to you in Visual Studio Xcode to pick, I want to build debug, I want to build release, I want to build some other one. And then you can just build. Um, for example, so MS build, I want to build my project in release mode because it generated all the views by default, and I can pick which one I want. Sure. I don't want to interrupt you, but I have a question about that. Uh, I don't know if I have a good one. Uh, Go for it. So if you have a CMake program that has some conditions based on what your site you're building is, does it mean that in order to generate the Visual Studio project, it will run through that twice with two different values for the CMake build type? So it depends. Um, when you say you have a condition for it, do you mean you have an if CMake build type uh, ester equal debug and do something over what's doing it? So no, it's not going to run twice. That's a big distinction we believe multiple configuration projects and single configuration projects is that uh, you cannot rely on one single uh, configuration to be available. The scripts are run once so it's not going to work. What you should do is use something that I can introduce later called generator expressions, which allows you to make some choices at a later stage. And so you make all the options available, and then you like see make, depending on the configuration project that is generating, choose which uh, parameters you will want to add. 
or which files you want to add or something like that. Um, it's a specific thing, but I believe that most people nowadays are actually going away from that and just separa creating separate build folders, uh, even for Visual Studio Xcode, uh, let's say uh, this is a build folder for debug, for release, for min size, uh, real, because it's hard to write correct uh, Cynic files that work everywhere. So I know that's what uh, Visual Studio is doing with a Cynic integration, for example. They will have several copies. Um, and also, I know that you asked uh, this uh, to me before, but there's no easy way to mix and match debug and release uh, targets in the same project. Uh, CMake is not really made for that. If you want to do that, you will need to fine tune it yourself. It's kind of tricky. Uh, so usually you will have everything with debug, everything with release. Um, that's how it is usually. There's no good tool to do that anyway. Um, but you're setting the CMake files to, to like have debug for one library. So you would not say uh, you have debug from one library. You, yeah, would, would, you will build everything. Yeah, you will build everything uh, in release or everything in debug. But I want just one library in debug. What, what, what options do I have? So why do you want one library in debug? Do you just but want to see? Because it's just oh, I have to debug this part, but this goes around it, everything else. So what you could do is um, build it in release mode and then have some configuration option that just adds um, compilation option just for that one library that reduces optimization level to zero, for example. That's one way of doing it. But there's no easy way to select which library you want for every different uh, configuration. Um, I would recommend to just make your software fast even in debug mode, if you can. Uh, if you can, uh, that, that, that's not always easy, but uh, that's a, a nice goal to have. Um, so now, there, there was a term that some people coined some time ago called uh, modern CMake. I want to show you like the difference between legacy and modern to show you how th things are different. So at the top level, you want to find the boost library. I say find package boost. I need it. If I don't find it, it's an error. And uh, CMake generation will stop. And I need to find the components called thread and system. So, but the same in legacy and modern, that hasn't uh, changed for a very long time. There's no reason to. But the thing that follows is uh, in legacy CMake, what you would get from uh, the find package call was variables. So we'd have a variable called boost uppercase B, lowercase, underscore, include dears, don't forget the S, it's a variable. You wouldn't have a target include directory, so you use include directory, so everything would use boost from this level to, um, and all subdirectories. So you have a variable here, and then you need to link uh, also your library with the thread library. So this is a string that points directly to the file for that library. Oh, and by the way, the thread library depends on system, so you also need to add the system library after it, because linkers expect libraries to be ordered in a certain way on the command line. So if uh, library A uses B, A should be first on the command line, then B. Otherwise, you will have issues while building on Linux and uh, Android. So you need to put both on the here. If you have more, um, boost dependencies, you will have to put them in the right order. And those are all strings with no checks, just strings. They could be empty and then it wouldn't do anything and you wouldn't know until it fails to compile. With modern CMake, what you do is just find package. It will create a boost colon colon thread will create boost colon colon boost, it will create boost colon colon system as well because you ask for it. But it will create one target, and one target is the only thing you do, you link against. You say my lib depends on boost thread. 
boost thread is another library that was defined in the find package script that depends on system. There was another system library, and the, the dependency was marked, uh, was de described in the find package call. And so you just use exactly what you depend on. You don't use, you don't have to put this library on all the dependencies. It's a target. It's not a string. It's less error prone. If boost suddenly says, when you use my library, you need to define this variable, then the only thing, uh, then here, you would need to add another call, target um, compile definitions, and pass this uh, preprocessor define. And if you don't have it, it will fail to compile. Here, Boost will say, OK, well, when uh, we, with this version of Boost, I need to have this defined. The file package script will know about it. It will add it to the target. And your code doesn't have to change. The same thing, underli the underlying Boost thread library might change, but it's a self-contained library target, and it will just work. So that's a big difference. Modern CMake is all about targets uh, that are just self-contained. They just work. This is a mess of variables that is very error-prone. Yes? If I'm not using system instead, do I then need to write it here? If you don't depend on system uh, directly yourself, you don't have to pass it. Here you have to pass it because maybe you're using a static version of Boost, and you need to pass system when you're using thread. Y your example implies that you still need to ask for it for system in find package, or is that just a constraint? Uh, yes, uh, you need to uh, ask for it. So if boost thread starts to depend on, say, the Datomic, I need to think of my CMake file, which can just use Datomic also. The script might uh, actually do it automatically for you. I'm not sure. Um, but I believe it will do it. I, be, I believe it should work, uh, but I didn't write it this way. <laughs> but um, yes, um, this this I know will work, um, and it might continue to work later on. It might not define the target atomic automatically, but it might link against the library still, because you ask for that library and so it should work. Or maybe it will just tell you in a later point you also need that other component and you didn't search for it. So uh, you might have a clear error message then. So that's modern CMake, um, via uh, no variables. So the best practices for modern CMake, which is the thing that you should remember, is that projects should be embeddable into one another. You should be able to copy files from one project, put it in your built uh, in your source folder, add subdirectory into that folder, and use the targets directly. All the targets should work directly. If you use them, you should be able to link against them. Um, either libraries or the executable should build without any extra configuration. They might not have all the different fancy options like uh, all warnings and the things like that that you may ask for when doing your library build, but it should be able to build. Something that is important is that you can have cyclic dependencies, but you shouldn't have any. Please make sure that your code is extracting the interface out of when you have like cyclic dependencies or merging um, targets together. Cy uh, cyclic dependencies are really bad at the linker level because then you need to pass some special flag to say uh, search in all those libraries together. It's kind of messy. Please make sure it's uh, a direct acyclic graph of um, uh, targets and not a graph with cycle. As I said, you should not rely on global commands because then you will have issues embedding, um, users will have issues embedding their libraries. You, sh you should have targets all the time and very few variables. Variables are mostly not needed. You should keep it declarative. Try not to have too many ifs and else around. That makes it complex, harder to understand. The simpler a build script is, the easier it is to use. 
and the easier it is to use on multiple platforms as well. Um, something that is important as well, when you build, uh, when you declare a target, you will want to list all the files, your source files, uh, CPP files, and your header files as well, because you want them all to appear in your um, IDE. If you're not, if you're not declared, uh, if your source files, CPP files are not declared, they're not going to be built, so those ones are kind of obvious. But if the header files are not declared, then they're not going to show in your IDE, they might not show in your um, um, code completion and things like that. That might be a little bit annoying. Just add them. Um, your when you define a library, just define them uh, for this folder and the files that are in the current folder or subfolders. Don't try to go back one level or two levels or find uh, files that are elsewhere. That's just spaghetti. It's a big mess. It's not very maintainable, and you don't know uh, to which file, um, to which target a file belongs to if you have this spaghetti um, built files. So please do not use dot dot. I do not try to walk around it with absolute paths as well. It's kind of bad. No. <laughs> so that's, uh, so as I said, uh, CMake is b generating build files for different um, tools like MS Build, Xcode Build, um, Ninja. Those do not support uh, globbing. So it's not going to work. You can use it in Make when writing your own Make files by hand but it's not something that CMake is going to work with. CMake is writing the description for uh, like how to build each file, but CMake needs to rerun to, re to regenerate a list of files that needs to be built when um, the CMake files have changed. But if you use a glob, the CMake files are never going to change. So CMake is never going to be rerun automatically when they change. So your new files are not going to, be to appear. Also, it's good practice to be explicit. If you're not explicit about your build files, you're going to start pulling random files around and you ne never sh you too much magic is happening. Uh, it's not good practice, especially when working with uh, software that is building on multiple platforms. You cannot use globs usually because then you will pull uh, the Android files when building for Windows and it's just going to be a mess. Uh, so just list all your files explicitly and makes it clear also when going through your build files in your git history as in history or your source control when a file has been introduced to the build and when it's used. Because sometimes you might want to take it out of the build, take it out of target, move it to a different one. It's um, explicit. So uh, no globs, please. Um, and yeah, so another thing that you can do that i have uh, using in some projects is that to make everything declarative, well, you can also define some command in CMake, some function, that is wrapping all the different low-level things. So I want to show you a uh, usage for it. So which is something for, so I rewrote uh, the boost build system in uh, CMake <coughs> for fun and giggles. And I wanted to um, have something that is a decorative way of defining all the boost target. And I came up with uh, a command called as bo add boost lib. That is custom, but I wrote myself and I can teach you how to write it well, or you can look at the source for it. There's a link to, uh, to it. And it takes a name, it takes a list of sources, it takes a list of defines that are private, you can have defines public, you can have include uh, directories. It's all declarative. And that's one command. By doing that, you make sure that you have only one entry point to define a library, <coughs> which means that if you need to make a change to the way you define your libraries for all your project, you just have to change one function. 
It's the same way that when you are factorizing your C++ code, do you repeat all your code again and again, or do you make functions? A build system is not different. You don't want to use um, low-level functions all the time that are error-prone. By restraining yourself to a, set, a, a function like this, you will have like fewer choices, and if a non-expert is going after you, you will know, okay, I just need to add my source file in that list. It's easy. And it knows it doesn't have to necessarily touch a lot of different things. So you can write some functions. Um, and I can show you how to write it. And well, that's a little bit of code. Uh, you can have a look at it if you want. And if you don't understand some things, just have a look at the documentation. But basically, I define a list of options that does the function can take. Function name is declared here. And then I pass all the arguments. And then I define all the things, like id library, boost with some name, static, and a lot of different things that are low level that I can talk about um, if you want more advanced scenarios. And I define all the different things that I want. And so if I want to change something at a higher level, but I just need to change one location and not everything. So that way you get declarative uh, definition of your project. And I have the same thing for decla declaring tests in my project. I say I have uh, tests that are, where the base name is system tests. Um, all the tests are linking with boost system and the tests are supposed to run a binary that is made of this file here. So this is going to create an axe executable with this that is linking against a boost system that is going to call it called add test, etc., and doing that for all the files. It's higher level scripting of your build files. If you do that, it's going to be a lot easier to maintain. So I would highly recommend to do something like that. That fits your use case, that fits your, um, your project. Because not all projects need the same thing, but if you have a lot of libraries, maybe you should see what is the common usage pattern. So, all right, you see. So, I got a lot of advanced examples, but I think I'm running out of time. So, if you want, I can talk about, you can have a look at them a little bit later. I can go really fast, really, really, really fast <laughs> about them, and you can have a, a look at the slides later. Um, le let's do that really fast. So in CMake, you have a lot of variables that are predefined. There's the documentation here that shows all of them. And those are all variables you can access. They all, all have information. They all have documentation. You should have a look at them. It's, it's important. Some important ones, for example, are the current binary folder, the current folder where you have the source file, you have the name of the system you're compiling for, for example, Android, Windows, or um, Mac. You have the name of the compiler if you need to de do detection, like depending on the compiler, you want different options. Or you have uh, build flags uh, that you might want to change at the global level, for example, for changing the C++ um, standard. So variables, something important. Uh, properties. Properties are something that belongs to targets. Targets, as I said, are libraries. Uh, they are executables. They can also be tests. They can be the directories themselves when you do as directory, and they can be source files. And each of those can have different properties. Each command that you call before target include directories, targeting libraries, are going to change those properties. They're just higher level macros that just change those properties. And so if you want to do some introspection, or use some advanced functionality that isn't exposed by a higher level command, you need to get to the properties directly. And for that, there's a get property um, command. For example, I want to say to get, to put in a variable called mylib sources, the list of source files for the target mylib. And you can get the list of source files and you can do something with them. Uh, and for example, printing them. Or for example, I want to say that my test uh, here 
it's supposed to fail. So if the test is passing, it's not, uh, an ex it's not matching the expectation, so C-test will fail it. Um, or you can say that this specific file is building with all warnings. Different, property, uh, different properties, there's a lot of them. Uh, I'll let you have a look at the documentation. Uh, there's general expressions that are um, a way to have, in a declarative way, um, some control flow. So, for example, I can set a property on a target that changes the name of the library depending on whether I'm building on debug or release to know which, whether the artifact, knowing, to know how the artifact has been built. So if I say that the output name of my build is mylib dollar uh, lower than config up event, and I build it for debug, it will create a lib mylib debug.a automatically. And that is changing. If I build it with release, it's going to change. But there's no direct conditionals in the code. It's not if it's building for debug, you build, you, you append debug. It's like you always append the, the name, and the name is dynamic. And you could do things with that, but it's more complex. It's like when I define my library, if I'm building on the platform Android, I want to add the Android CPP file, or if it's on Windows, some other file. And then it's going to be resolved automatically. That's a declarative way to actually have some um, choices in your uh, definitions, target definitions. You have tool chains, uh, which is a way to declare your tool chain, uh, how, what compiler you use, what options. So um, that's how you do cross compilation. So for example, a tool chain, a file called android.cmake that has this, will enable from CMake 3.6, I believe, to build, um, to find the, uh, the NDK and to use the compiler in there and to build and targeting a different system. Uh, if you want to pass global options, you should probably build your own toolchain file. There's an extensive documentation about them to say I want to build everything with uh, C14 or with address sanitizer or different option or targeting your existing, uh, existing system. You can have also integration of various tools like client ID or include what you use. You have some code uh, that you set it up so that when you actually run, uh, when you actually build your software, it will run Clang Tidy, which is a tool that finds, uh, it's a linter tool, it will find programming errors in your code automatically, which is a modern way to do things. That's how um, um, companies like Google, um, Apple, and many others are finding defects automatically in their code. Uh, there's a lot of checks in there, so you should probably use it. Have a look on the internet, there's a, a lot of documentation about it. But you can use it directly from CMake. Uh, you can use uh, Ccache, which is a compiler cache, which is a way to save all the artifacts when you build to actually have faster rebuild time. There's a way to set it up in a way that is totally transparent, and when you build, it's going to use Ccache. If you use that on your uh, continuous integration machines, it's going to be great. Uh, and you have another way to import libraries. I import the source files from Google Test in my project, and I use them directly. Uh, I user sources, and then I have GTS that is available in my project. You can have a look at the documentation. I do not invent this. This is copy-pasted directly from it. And there's a lot more things to learn about uh, CMake that I didn't cover because it's a very big uh, tool. You can do packaging of software with it, create installers, create uh, Debian packages, RPMs. Uh, there's a way to do that. Have a look at the documentation. You have a lot of different modules, uh, libraries that come with CMake that uh, makes it easier to do a lot of different things. There's a list of modules. You can have a look and the ones that have interesting names, read the documentation, see what they're doing. Lots of, lots of variables, lots of third-party modules like Cotire, which is due, uh, allows Unity builds, which is uh, another way to do faster builds. Uh, you can use some of the libraries which provides a lot of tool chains for different platforms. There's a lot of things. It's a vast ecosystem. So you can have a look, Google it. Um, you'll, you'll find a lot of different things and a lot of different things that I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, but 
I don't have time, so if you have any question, it's now. Otherwise, I believe we can just go and have some food. Yeah, okay. We will, we will make some food, but there are questions to the recipients, and then we need to rearrange the room a little bit for the, for the workshop also. So I need to cut you out for, for a short time. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, if you have questions, I'm going to be around. Ask me questions. Otherwise, we have a workshop uh, with some material that is available online on GitHub. Some exercises, basic exercises, or more advanced exercises with CMake. You can have some fun with that. I'll be around to help you if you need help.